Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Betcher, and welcome to the Wellesley Free Library. We're happy to see all of you on this beautiful afternoon. Um, it is on. OK. I will speak loudly. <laughs> okay. um, so as always, we have information about the library's uh, programs on the table to your right. So please take a look at those sheets on your way out. Sign up to receive our monthly newsletter, if you wish. And we also, at the end of each program, we offer feedback sheets. So if you want to give us some quick feedback, back about today's program or ideas about programming you'd like to see here at your library, please let us know via those forms. And also our guest today has brought books for sale, so we will have a nice uh, book sign and I have some presents and cookies over there. So please stick around and you know have uh, some time to gather and socialize. Um, so now I am very happy to introduce Brooks Fenno. Mr. Fenno is the author of the new book, Cor Corporate Diversification, Opportunities Created by the Winds of Change, a reflection of his 50 years of work experience and strat I'm sorry, 50 years of work experience and strat strategies of diversification. A Harvard business graduate, Mr. Fenno has personally worked with over 250 client firms. He is a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Business School. He is also a military veteran who served as an artillery officer with the 101st, 101st Airborne Division. Mr. Fenno has also taught, mar taught marketing strategy at Babson College. His earlier book is the best-selling Helping Your Business Grow, 101 Dynamic Ideas in Marketing. So let's give a warm welcome to Brooks Fenno. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to uh, preface my presentation with a couple of uh, words. Uh, the first is diversification. Now, to understand diversification, one should think about companies starting out. They start out with a core business, and the core business expands until it reaches a point uh, most typically where it runs out of gas. And we'll talk more about what running out of gas means later on, but it uh, requires the owner, if they want to continue to grow the business, to diversify into new uh, products or services. And so uh, that will be one of the thrusts of the talk today. The second part of the talk is the word change. Now, one could write uh, probably three volumes on what the word change means because it relates to all of us uh, in our lives. I'm only going to take the part that most closely ties in to diversification. So bear with me in that respect. Uh, change is something that I find is a fascinating experience. And uh, you'll see that in this talk. Now, there are four categories that I put under the concept of change. And the, I'd like to start by asking each of you to think about change not as you're part of it, because you are, but to think about it in the abstract sense and look at yourself separate from the change that you experience. And so uh, in doing that, uh, we will talk about your positioning, but see where you would fit in the spectrum of change if, in terms of your acceptance of change uh, on a scale of one to 10 personally. Now there are two major reasons why we change, uh, basically two. Uh, the first is that the opportunity presents itself to change, and it's such an attractive opportunity that you can't pass it up. And of course that's related to the amount of physical and mental effort that is required to make that change, and the amount of financial risk that you're taking to make that change. Uh, so. There are some small changes that are a lot easier to make than some of the bigger changes, like buying a car or a house or something like that, which requires a major risk, a major investment, and a major uh, commitment. And 
The next uh, part of that, the other reason is that you are uncomfortable with what uh, you're experiencing. That's the other reason to change. If the situation suddenly makes itself uh, un unbearable for you, uh, to the extent that it is bothering you, you will try something different. And those are the two kind of parameters for making change. And the question then becomes as to how well do you adapt to change? Now we all have different adaption rates, and I ask you to personally think about the rate at which you adapt to change. Now keep in mind, and this is one of my favorite analogies, the floating platform perspective. And that means that if you picture yourself as a polar bear, either male or female, floating on an ice floe, and you're looking around on that ice floe, and you don't see any change at all because the ice flow appears to you to be constant. But actually the ice flow is in the middle of an ice flow itself and it's flowing with the current or tides if it's loose and it's flowing with the, uh, with the water stream. And so while you're looking around, uh, you are actually changing because your footwork, your position is changing. Uh, and of course, uh, your age is a factor in the change. Now, many of us, because of, uh, because of technology, uh, going back for a step, uh, because of technology, it's been accelerating at a very rapid rate. And you take uh, George Moore, who probably some of you are familiar with. Uh, he is the person who was coined as having said uh, that uh, microchip uh, every two years uh, is doubles its power. And that has been continuing for the last number of years, uh, which is just an illustration of the fact that uh, we're going through a, a, a tremendous era of, of change. Uh, and there's an article that was just in the Wall Street Journal, which won't give you any hope in this respect, uh, but it says, this was this week, the iPhone, Amazon, and Uber have yet to deliver the kind of productivity boom that led to a burst in American prosperity in the previous era of technological advances. But new data suggests the latest technology boom is starting to give the economy a jolt. If you don't think we've got enough technology going on and enough change going on, just wait a minute. Now, technology covers uh, a broad front. Uh, the next area of change is the global change. And of course, we've noticed that in places like Africa, uh, the Far East, where they had no communications in the form of uh, a telephone <laughs> because they couldn't string the wires far enough, they now have cell phones and they have the internet. And so the world in that sense is shrinking. And because it's shrinking, we're getting more and more involved in world affairs. And of course, we travel now extensively uh, by airline and other means uh, to some of these remote spots without thinking twice about it. Now, the next is the area of climate change. Uh, climate change is a slow change, and you can either be a believer that natural factors are at work in making our climate warmer, or you can believe that carbon emissions is a factor, or there's some combination of the two. Uh, but it's definitely affecting uh, such things as the ocean, which represents three quarters of the world, and you're now finding at the bottom of the deepest trench in uh, the world, underwater, you're finding pieces of uh, plastic. Uh, and so we're gradually, and the fish population is shifting, so we're gradually feeling uh, climate change. And so technology is a factor in both the global and the climate change, which are more slowly relating to us, but are happening uh, as well. And one of the interesting things that I find about 
of the global change is it's getting warmer in Africa. And as it gets warmer in Africa and as the storms appear in Africa, the drought is uh, corresponding with those storms. The drought is driving the people who are increasing at a rapid rate faster if population increased in, in our part of the world. They're driving them north. And they're driving them north and they're, going, they're having a big problem, as you know, in Europe with the uh, assimilation of people. Now, we're a bit protected, but we're even feeling that too. And uh, we're protected both as the United States is sort of uh, an island in a sense, a large island, and we're protected on the north and the south with uh, Canada and Mexico. But uh, it's happening everywhere. Now, moving on to the personal side, uh, we just talked a minute ago about that. And we're all down to the bottom here uh, of the floating platform, the perspective that we're at. Uh, and uh, we're, feeling, we're feeling, a lot of us are feeling pressured uh, because our lives are, are trying to absorb very hard the environment in which we're involved in. And of course, the technology is moving faster than we are able to absorb it. And that's creating a pressure in our lives. And I, I think that we all uh, recognize that to some extent. Now, let's take some practical examples of how this change is affecting us. Uh, right here, we're sitting in a library. Now, let's think for a moment about the library. For those of us who've gone back a few years, uh, the library uh, in our childhood, uh, you came to the library for two reasons. First, to borrow books, and second, to sit in the library and read some of the books that were on display. Uh, the library is part of a town. The town consists of such key factors as a church, as a school, uh, as a town hall, as a post office. Those are kind of go with the town. Uh, what we're experiencing here is a, an edifice that is not going to change physically, but it needs to change to adapt to uh, what its requirements are. And uh, the library has evolved into a community and cultural center. And there are a number of resources that it offers besides the books. And, uh, and they're listed there. Uh, one of those is a meeting facility. You have this talk that uh, I'm involved in right now. You have all sorts of activities going on, game centers, dances, and it's a center for meetings, uh, business, political, and social. They can all come uh, and assemble here uh, as a source of, of space and commonality and center. Now, let's go to another uh, example. The American Automobile Association. For those of you who can sit back a while, uh, you can remember that the American Automobile Association uh, did two things. It provided you with roadside assistance. Uh, I had my battery charged several times in the child and younger driving years. And trip planning, for those of you who wanted uh, to take a trip. Now, currently, American Automobile Association has expanded its services. It's evolved. Uh, it's diversified. Uh, I just got my license renewed at the American Automobile Association office in Needham. Uh, you get a number of discounts, uh, hotels, uh, theater, uh, restaurants, and you get such things as uh, money, uh, insurance, and uh, personal loans from uh, from uh, the American Automobile Association. Now, this raises a very interesting point, and this is one of the key things that I'd like to leave you with today, which I call the cloud of opportunity. Now, there are a lot of clouds. A lot of these clouds are floating around. 
Some are big, some are small, some are thin, some are thick. Uh, there are all kinds of configurations. And the way in which it works is that, whoops, the way in which it works is that, uh, sorry about that. Um, here is your cloud. This wants to go to the next slide, but we won't let it. Here is your cloud, uh, which forms an opportunity for somebody to come along with a, uh, an idea. And if it's a solid cloud, uh, the concept will grow, and I use the analogy of a mountain. It will grow up towards that cloud. As the cloud uh, maintains itself and its energy is, is there, the uh, edifice, uh, which is the mountain here, will get bigger. And the, the edifice doesn't just grow straight. It gains layers. It gains layers of management as it grows. And the, the uh, layers pile on top of each other and create a structure that becomes increasingly uh, immobile. And if the cloud is sufficient, you'll get competitive clouds, uh, I mean competitive edifices uh, such as you see here. Now, the interesting thing here is that the cloud moves. It it does not stay where it's started out as. And it moves at different speeds for different kinds of clouds. So you've got in your life a lot of different clouds moving at a lot of different speeds, which just further confuses the way things go. The, this cloud uh, in the picture has moved over to here. And so we see focusing on that cloud is a new core of opportunity, a new business has developed, and so on and so on. As these clouds shift, the business is on. My job over 40 years or so of, of consulting was to help companies that were rigidly involved here focus on where their cloud was moving. And uh, it worked in various different ways in different situations, and that's what I'm gonna show you next. Um, all right, the first, the first is uh, Polaroid. <laughs> now, Polaroid had a rather interesting beginning and a rather interesting ending. Edwin Land started Polaroid, as you probably know, in Cambridge. And the way it started is rather interesting because his daughter, age three, was out in the garden one day and he was taking pictures with his camera. But his daughter said to him, his three-year-old daughter, you know, Daddy, why can't we have the picture that we're taking right away? And that started him thinking and that created Polaroid in 1937. Now, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess because of the growth of the company, worked out well, but unfortunately, Edwin Land was very rigid in his thinking, as indicated by the sign, uh, the arrow there. Uh, he couldn't see any other cloud coming along besides the one-stop camera that he had produced, which could take a picture and develop it all in one. He couldn't visualize anything possibly coming along past that. So Polaroid never diversified. And in, 19, uh, in 2001, a Polaroid that never diversified, never got into anything new, went bankrupt. Now, let's try another case. Um, Dunkin' Donuts. They're an uh, organization that has been fairly flexible in their adaptation uh, to the needs and changes of their clientele. Uh, William Rosenberg founded Dunkin' Donuts in 1950. Today, there are over 12,000 uh, Dunkin' Donut restaurants in 36 countries around the world. Now, they started out very simply with coffee and donuts, but since then they have moved on to having a full menu of sandwiches and so forth. Uh, they have added a drive-in. Uh, you can get a 
full serious lunch and dinner there. Uh, you can even buy their coffee at the grocery store. Uh, and they finally, most recently, in recognition of their change, they've changed their name to Duncan. And then we have another, uh, I keep pressing the wrong button here, sorry. Uh, the next one is uh, Amazon. Now you're all familiar with Amazon. I'm sure many of you use it on a regular basis. Jeff Bezos started Amazon in 1994 with the realization that maybe it would be easier to, uh, and less expensive uh, and simpler to sell a book directly from uh, the publisher uh, to the reader and not go through the middle channels of the book, uh, book store. Uh, and now Amazon has become it's evolved through uh, being adaptable uh, to uh, the largest internet seller uh, in the world. And uh, it has 613,000 employees. Now, not only does it sell books, uh, tablets, et cetera, et cetera, but if you want to publish your book, you can publish it uh, through Amazon's advising system. And of course, they sell household items, lawn furniture, electronics, toys, apparel, and most recently they've expanded their distribution speed and they're working on having, uh, having more immediate delivery from local sources right into your house, uh, maybe by self-driving cars uh, down the line. Now let's take a look at some of the uh, forms of diversification. And I have categorized diversification into a number of steps or a number of, of categories. And each of these categories is uh, listed in a way in which they're more difficult and more uh, involved than the one above. Now, tweaks. We all tr have tweaks. We all do tweaks. A tweak could be anything as simple as changing your message on your answering machine. Uh, or it could be uh, deciding which clothes you're going to wear. Uh, or on a little more difficult basis, uh, it would be maybe to change your supplier at work or uh, let one of your employees go. It's something that can happen on a regular basis but doesn't require a tremendous amount of adjustment. Now, then we move into the category of new products into current markets. Now, there is some risk there. The success in terms of defining it by a 50% return on your investment, uh, I mean, a, a return on your investment in five year, uh, years, uh, it's 50% if you go new products into current markets. And I'm gonna divest, divert uh, my comments here and give you some examples. Uh, one of the projects that I worked on a number of years ago, uh, if you think back to when you were a child uh, and you looked at a lobster trap, it was all made of wood. And so I had the opportunity, I was engaged by a company that made steel uh, lobster traps, wire lobster traps. And their job was that they gave me was to take the wire lobster trap and introduce it to the lobsterman community. Now you can't picture a group any more reticent to change than a lobsterman. So I, I, uh, I forgot whether I bribed them, I got a couple of lobstermen along the coast of Maine to try the new metal lobster traps. <clears throat> The other lobstermen poo-pooed the whole idea. They said lobsters will never come into a metal trap. They like wood. So uh, we tried it. At the end of the year, uh, the lobstermen brought up their uh, metal traps, the ones that did, and they piled them next to their house, and they went on and did their thing. Meanwhile, the other lobstermen who had the wooden traps, and you can have up to a 1,000 traps, the wooden trap people went home. They had to take their par traps apart, repair them, put in all new uh, wood slats and so forth, uh, which was a good month or two's worth of work. Next year, the uh, following year, um, 
there was a, they were a little bit more uh, accepting, and we got a half a dozen lobstermen to try the metal traps. Again, the other ones were very suspicious of the whole process. And by the third year, everybody was using a metal trap. And you won't find any wooden traps anymore anywhere. Um, so the reason that uh, uh, that new product going into a current market is that you understand the market and hopefully have an inroad into the market uh, and some reputation involved. It didn't happen in that case, but it was uh, it was an example of of going after a current market with a new product. <laughs> the next is new markets, current products. Now. There's only a 25% chance of success if you take a new market into a current product. Uh, that's because while you think you can manufacture more of the current products without any extra effort, just increase your production run, uh, the receptivity, you have to start all over again with the marketplace. And so your acceptance there is only around 25%. Uh, the best working option in that field uh, for companies in the Northeast are to sell over into Europe. Europe represents a different market, but it, it's somewhat uh, uh, similar in the way and habits by which people do things. And of course, with our technology, the product that we're offering for the European market is probably superior to what they're currently using. Now, <coughs> Uh, the next area is uh, an example of uh, uh, a combination. Uh, firms don't often just simply go after one form of diversification, but they'll embrace several at once. And Fisher Engineering is a good example. Now. All of you have seen Fisher products, but probably most of you don't know what they are. The Fisher product is the Fisher snowplow that goes on the front of a two and a half ton truck that plows the snow or used to plow the snow out of your driveway. So the problem that I had, which I was hired to uh, advise, was whether Dean Fisher, with his facility to make these plows uh, out of uh, Rockport, uh, uh, Maine, whether he, or Rockland, Maine, I guess it was, whether he could uh, sell these into the Midwest against the Meyer snowplow. The Meyer snowplow was the one that was made in Wisconsin and sold uh, in the Midwest. And the difficulty there, of course, is a snowplow of that size is very heavy and costly to ship. Well, one thing led to another. We decided that the Fisher plow had uh, operational advantages and was easier to put on and put off of the truck and so it was sold into the Midwest and successfully so. Uh, fast forward a few years, Dean Fisher, uh, the owner of the company, uh, retired. He sold the company and he sold it to Myers. And Myers today has uh, Fisher Plow sold here, and it sells Myers out in the Midwest and the Far West. However, Myers has been sold, and the company that bought Myers uh, has diversified in two ways. The first thing that they did was they introduced home uh, snow cleaning devices. Uh, which I'm sure many of you have, are familiar with now. The second thing they did is they took the dealer network that uh, uh, Fisher had used to sell snow plows in the winter, and they gave them garden tools to sell in the summer. So it, it worked very well because they had the distribution already set up. Uh, now, in terms of uh, new creation, uh, uh, the word foundry is, uh, some of you are familiar with a foundry, it's a method of, of forming iron uh, in a heat intensive basis so that it can uh, be a product that goes into other products uh, for sale. And Seaboard Foundry is located in uh, Rhode Island. 
And the owner of Seaboard Foundry had done quite well with that, and he had a boat. And his boat was on Narragansett Bay. And he realized that sailing on Narragansett Bay, he, did, he couldn't use really a regular anchor with the flukes because there was no uh, firm ground, uh, stone or rock on the bottom of Narragansett Bay where he had his, his boat. And so there was nothing for the, to hold the anchor in place. And he realized that if he made a mushroom anchor, which was to take the waste products from his uh, foundry, he could form them into a teardrop a mushroom anchor, and that would uh, allow him to uh, uh, enter that market. And at that point, Wilcox, who was the major manufacturer of fluked mushrooms, was having some sales problems. They'd lost their sales manager, and so there was an opportunity for him to move right in. And so uh, that sort of are some of the range of examples. Uh, the one last one here is acquisitions. Now, acquisitions sound like a very nice thing to do, and they are, but they're very expensive. They're expensive because the seller, who can often be a private company, uh, uh, they demand a high price because they value their product at certainly or service that is certainly a very high rate uh, because it's theirs. Uh, they uh, also, it's very hard to find uh, good acquisition candidates. Very expensive. And also you inherit some problems which obviously the seller is not going to tell you about. Uh, so uh, the acquisition rate of success uh, runs somewhere from uh, around five to 10%. Uh, and they're not as, as lucrative as you might think they might be. And so in conclusion, I want you to remember several things here. First of all, you were in motion, like the uh, 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 polar bear. <laughs> You're moving. Your environment is moving. It's all changing. And it's important that you consider the second point here, which we'll talk more about in a second, whether you're controlling or are controlled uh, in terms of your environment. The third is seek opportunities. Uh, opportunities come across your uh, periphery constantly, but we don't, we don't grasp them. And, and that is something that ne needs to be said. And be receptive. Now my wife here, uh, she, uh, she believes in saying yes to every opportunity that is presented. Sometimes it doesn't work, but most of the time it does. So if you get an opportunity to try something new, try it. You can't lose, for the most part. And uh, so uh, initiate the action or be on the receiving end of the action. And here we have the waves in which you're uh, uh, living part of every day. Notice it's a fairly choppy one. And here's the wave coming along, and you can decide where on this wave you want to be. Do you want to be at the forefront of the wave of change, or do you want to be back here or somewhere in between? And uh, that uh, concludes my talk, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have.